All right, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, how is everybody tonight? Oh, my local ne'er-do-well just stopped by about 35 seconds ago, and I just had to tell him, no, I do a live stream. I do a live stream, and it's not time for you to tell me how whatever has gone wrong in your life and why you need me to give you 20 bucks. Oh, look at Sharbo. Hi, Sharbo. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome. It is, what is it? It is Sunday night. That means it's Benchley night. Awesome. Oh, I get confused because I also do my reasonably fine art talk. I do that on Wednesdays at 1.45 p.m. And um, I think, I think my guest this coming Wednesday is going to be a guy named Evan Stair, who is... Uh, just a guy I've never actually, maybe, and I don't think I've actually met him. Um, but he and I are both passenger rail advocates and we'll be talking about uh, what the ongoing tragedy of America's, uh, what's going on with Amtrak. And don't be fooled, ladies and gentlemen, just because Uncle Drifty likes Amtrak does not mean that all the, the nationwide network of long distance passenger rail is in any way safe. It is deeply, deeply imperiled. And the current management is doing all they can to build up a set of statistics to show that it is no longer needed and that we should just be running trains between big city pairs, short distance trains. Anyway, we're probably gonna be talking about that on Wednesday. So if you're not doing anything on Wednesday at 1.45 p.m. and wanna get into the weeds about American transportation policy, please join us. Well, Sharbo seems to be settling down, so I think it is time to do a few shout outs. Today's beneficiary, of course, was uh, the, the Wyndham County Humane Society, uh, who are, they have nothing to do with Sharbo or with Yorkie, but uh, they do good work. And we should all support our local Humane Society. And I am glad to say we raised about a hundred bucks, so thank you all. And I have a few shout outs to give from the unidentified unglet in the can. Are you ready? First off, to Mr. J.T. Mayor. <coughs> Next, to our good friend, our good friend, the peripatetic Terry Hudson. <coughs> then. <laughs> To their 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 travel plans were thwarted by uh, the current Amtrak administration. See what trains used to do. Oh, Yorkie's here now too. What trains used to do was they would always run. Rain, sleet, snow. There were parallel. There were various routes they could take. If one route got blocked, they could go to another route. The new Amtrak management is mostly people from airlines. And so if bad weather threatens, they cancel, they cancel the trains. Well, Gary Pierce and Aline Cortez stuck in Chicago, getting to see Chicago a whole lot more than they were planning on. Gary and Aline, thank you so much. <coughs> now, fellow, fellow alumni of the uh, Roots on the Rails train, someone who today commented that she missed the days we used to travel the trains in our cars. A friend to all, ladies and gentlemen, a friend to all, the great Martha Rowley. <coughs> Here in Bellows Falls, Vermont, a man who gets put in Facebook jail almost every day, every week, every month, Mr. Rick Gavatsky. <coughs> of artist friend, stalwart supporter of the Benchley Knights, wonderful human being, Ms. Catherine Fisher. <laughs> and out there, out there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, out there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where the steel mills, abandoned though they are, still reach to the sky, reaching even higher, even higher, my very, very, very tall cousin, Mr. Nat Hunter and his wonderful wife, Elise. <coughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. 
Now put the cares of the world away for a moment. Put the cares of the world away and let us just enjoy a little Robert Benchley. Bad news. There are certain days when I don't want to hear about certain things. You know what I mean? Today, I do not want to hear about fur-bearing trout. <laughs> the very <laughs> the very words fur-bearing trout are offensive to me, either in print or in the spoken word. So today I read that a man has reported to the Anglers Club that he has discovered fur-bearing trout. That is the way my whole life has been. At first, I... <laughs> At first, I thought I wouldn't read about it. This is a free country, I said to myself, smiling sadly. You don't have to read anything you don't want to read. Skip it. Go to the next page. Keeping abreast of current events is one thing. But masochism is another. But that old New England streak in me, that atavistic yearning for a bad time, if a bad time can be had, turn my eyes, <laughs> turn my eyes down into the column, which was headed, fur-bearing trout amazes anglers. Its pelt is called Shore Goiter Cure. And here I am, not only thinking about it, but actually writing about it. I may not be able to, <laughs> I may not be able to finish, but here I am, passing the unhappy news on to you. William C. Adams, Director of Fish and Game Activities of the State Conservation Commission of New York, is the authority. Passing up for the moment just what fish and games activities call for direction, let us accept Mr. Adams as a man who knows his piscatorial onions. He has everything to lose and nothing to gain by frightening me with a cock and bull story about fur-bearing trout. He says, quote, deep in the lakes of Yellowstone, where the waters are so cold they never freeze, Looking you straight in the eye has been discovered this peculiar denizen of the deep. Its fur has been, been found extremely useful in the prevention of goiters. When collected into a neck piece, the possibilities are unlimited, end quote. This would seem an understatement. The possibilities of a neck piece made of trout pelts would not only be unlimited, they would be staggering. They would be staggering. It could easily drive the wearer crazy just by her thinking of what she had on. It would start a civil war. What is that lovely fur you have on, my dear? That is unborn trout. My husband caught them. Pistol shots ring out. Brother takes up arms against brother. The country dissolves rapidly into chaos. I feel that such news as this, which Mr. Adams brings, should be kept from the public. It does no one any good to know that there are such things as fur-bearing trout. If the pelts are good for goiters, let goiter sufferers take advantage of them under another name, such as piscaterin or trout oxen. If neck pieces must be made of them, let us go to the French for the mode and call them fourrier de trout. But please let us not go about talking of fur-bearing trout or trout pelts. At any rate, please, just not today. And the second piece for tonight, ladies and gentlemen, isn't it remarkable 
On a recent page of colored reproductions of tomb paintings and assorted excavations from holes in ancient Egypt, there appears a picture of a goose with the following rather condescending, <laughs> with the following rather condescending caption, remarkably accurate and artistic painting of a goose from, from Pharaoh Akhenaten's palace, drawn 3,300 years ago. What I want to know is why the word remarkable? Why is it any more remarkable this <laughs> that someone drew a goose accurately 3,300 years ago than someone should do today. Why should we surprise that the people who built the pyramids could also draw a goose so that it looked like a goose? As a matter of fact, the goose in this particular picture looks more like a goose than many of that of a modern master. Just what we, just what we think we are in this age of bad drawing to call an Egyptian painting, quote, remarkably accurate and artistic, I do not know. But we have got to get over this feeling that anything that was done correctly in 1000 BC was a phenomenon. I say that we've got to get over it, but I don't know how. People managed to drag along in ancient Egypt from all that we can gather. They may not have known about chocolate malted milk balls, and opera hats, but what with one thing and another, they got by. And presumably, every, every once in a while, someone felt like drawing a goose. And why not? Is there something exclusively 20th century about the art of goose drawing? We are constantly being surprised that people did things well before we were born. We're constantly remarking on the fact that things are done well by people other than ourselves. The Japanese are a remarkable little people, we say, as if we were doing them a favor. He, he is an Arab, but you ought to hear him play the zither. Why, but? <laughs> Another thing, possibly not exactly in this connection, but in line with our amazement of obvious things. People are always saying, my grandfather is 82 and interested in everything. He reads the paper every day and follows everything. Well, why shouldn't, <laughs> why shouldn't he be interested in everything at age 82? Why shouldn't he be especially interested in everything at 82? What is there so remarkable about his reading the paper every day and being conversant on all topics? If he isn't interested in everything at age 82, when is he going to be? I seem to be asking an awful lot of questions. Do not bother answering them, please. It is probably this naive surprise of things that keeps us going. If we took it for granted that the ancient Egyptians could draw a goose accurately, or the Eskimos could sing bass, or the grandpa should be interested in everything at age 82, there would not be anything for us to hang our own superiority on. And if we couldn't find something to hang our own superiority on, and if we couldn't think of, and if we couldn't find something to hang our own superiority on, we should be sunk. We should be just like those ancient Egyptians or the Eskimos or grandpa. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's our little, our little putting our cares away, putting our cares away. And thank you again. Thank you again, Catherine, for the gift of this wonderful copy of my 10 years in a quandary. It is, it is a joy. So thank you all. We'll see you next Sunday. We'll see you next Sunday for another Benchley night. And if you feel like hearing about American passenger trail passenger train railroading. Join us Wednesday for the reasonably fine art talk.
kind of tangential what it has to do with art, but Wednesday at 1.45 p.m. Eastern, if you're not doing anything else. You take good care. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.